Welcome to the At The Coalface podcast with your host, Jason Greenwood. This podcast is all about what it's really like in the trenches of digital and e-commerce. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the At The Coalface podcast. I have an absolute cracker of a podcast episode lined up for you today. I have Chris Mattingly and I have Reese Laval from Sparklayer on the pod. I get two for one out of this one. Welcome to the pod, gentlemen. Hi, Jason. Yeah, thanks very much for having us. Hello. How's it going? Uh, How's it going? Yeah, look, it's super good. I'm at the end of my day. You're at the beginning of your day. You're, you guys are both based in England. I'm based in Auckland. And so it's about eight o'clock in the evening here and it's morning for you guys. So this is going to be a good one because hopefully you've dosed up on coffee and you're ready to hit the ground running. Yeah, no, both, both ready to go. Very, very excited. Let's do it. So two co-founders of Sparklayer. And for those that don't know, Sparklayer is effectively a standalone to be platform for Shopify merchants that plugs into Shopify as an app, but it is much more fully featured than I guess what your typical, say, single function, basic functionality app would be. It's almost like it's almost like an adjacent platform for B2B running on Shopify, correct? Yeah, exactly right. There to design that there to solve which is a huge problem we're seeing around B2B and wholesale and Shopify. But it, it does effectively take any Shopify on any Shopify plan, whether you're on basic, advanced, plus, effectively enables a really slick sort of B2B portal. So the idea is the merchants can invite their customers, they can log in, see the pricing, go through the whole process. And it's all designed to be very sort of self-service. So you know, it takes a lot of the, the manual actions away from the merchant. Historically within B2B, merchants deal with lots of spreadsheets, lots of offline ordering. The whole goal of our solution is to bring that online, make life easier on merchants. An key thing it does as well, it also integrates with lots of systems, these CRMs, which again, is a huge sort of pain point across the industry. And that's really what we're sort of trying to solve. And one last thing, it's not just centered around Shopify. The idea a long time or the goal has been built to put onto other platforms, Magento, big commerce, commerce tools. So maybe this is another platform will be soon. Love it. Love it, gentlemen. That is awesome. Now, before we get into all of the exciting quote unquote competition between Shopify's recently announced B2B functionality suite, which as we all know, and I think we'd all admit is not even first base from a B2B functional perspective, but let's, we'll compare and contrast that a little bit later on, but I'd love to understand a little bit more about your origin story. And I know Chris, look, Blue Bolt's e-commerce agency, you've been doing that for over 16 years. That's a bloody long time, co-founder of Blue Bolt, and clearly have a deep, deep and broad level of experience with e-commerce. And you were saying before we actually started recording that you'd effectively built out an e-commerce platform. And Reese, DevOps engineer with Blue Bolt, I'm guessing that's how you two met in the first place was via Blue Bolt and then became co-founders of Sparklayer together. And I've been running Sparklayer for nearly two years now. Do you guys want to just walk us through a little bit of how Sparklayer came to be? Why Sparklayer? Why now? Why you felt this was an opportunity that was too good to pass up? Were you scratching an itch? Did you see a market gap? All of yeah, that's a great question. I mean, as, as you say, this is this marks the sixteenth year of so running Blue Bolt. So Blue Bolt historically was actually a e-commerce platform provider and an agency. So we were quite unique in our day. We were both building software and managing a really growing so customer base. Over the course of 10 years, we actually engineered a really quite powerful e-commerce platform. I guess the big thing was it was both B2C and B2B, which yeah, even back then there was, there was a high demand for it. And over, over the course of 10 years, we had some really high profile customers using it at its peak. Transacted about four hundred million dollars per year through the platform. So yeah, really, really sort of gave, gave us a good lay of the land in terms of yeah understanding e-commerce both from a, a merchant point of view, but also around the functionality they need. Three years ago, we I guess noticed a big shift within the industry. More and more customers and merchants were I guess opting for more so well-known platforms, the Shopify, the Magento, big commerce, etc. So we actually did a, a big pivot within Blue Bolt. Yeah, we actually moved our entire operation to become a Shopify Plus agency. Yeah, the goal was to focus purely on that platform and sort of grow our profile through that. And it's been, been very successful over the last three years. But rele relevant to this, even before we actually transitioned, we were aware of some sort of key limitations from Shopify. Probably the biggest one was B2B you know, through our 
sort of previous life. We were f- very familiar with B2B. I'd say half our customers used to do B2B and B2C as a hybrid. But as soon as we moved to Shopify, that came to an end. We literally could not fulfill what customers were asking. So yeah, early on in the transition, we knew it was a big problem to solve. Two years ago, yeah, Reese approached me directly. He also happened to work at Blue Vault a few years before. We decided to try and solve this problem together. As Reese hinted at before, we initially engineered it to be a headless solution. Because we knew even three years ago, we knew at some point Shopify would release their own version and respond to the market. But we knew that there was an immediate appetite. So yeah, so two, two years ago, we spent probably the first six months proving the concepts. Could we find a way to bring in pricing? Could we find a way to connect to systems? Could we create a checkout process? All the big questions which we knew had to be solved. In terms of milestones, April, May last year was when the app, I guess, got officially approved. So it does quite literally exist as a public app, which any Shopify merchant can install. Yeah, we had a few full starts when we actually first launched it. Over the last 12 months, we've seen, yeah, it's really great growth. You know, lots of you know, really fast growing merchants have come on board, brought about 500 customers in total, which not insignificant, but also yeah, it's proven that this is a product people want and there's a huge demand for it, not just in Shopify, but further afield as you say. So that's a real sort of top level plotted history. But ultimately, yeah, we knew there was a big problem to solve and we, yeah, we tried to come together to come up with a way, way to do it. Love it. Trying to become part of a, a an existing juggernaut of an ecosystem like Shopify, even getting approval to be listed in their app store. I know that a lot of companies really struggle to, to get through that phase. And then obviously you've got regional variations of the app store and what gets promoted versus demoted, et cetera. So I know there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of challenge just getting listed in the app store to begin with. But Reese, is there any gaps in that from your perspective that you'd like to speak to? As the co-founder of Sparklayer, was there anything that you saw, I guess, evolving in the market? And again, we'll get into the specifics of the platform a bit later on, but were there any gaps? I, like, for example, my, my consultancy, there was a very clear reason why I wanted to specialize. And I knew right from day one, I wanted to specialize in B2B and D2C as opposed to B2C brands and mo- mostly B2B brands that are trying to establish a D2C channel. And one of the reasons why I did that was because I saw a tremendous amount of blue ocean space in B2B where... Not a lot of agencies specialized in B2B, not a lot of e-commerce platforms specialized in B2B, and certainly very and even fewer consultants specialized in B2B. And when we're talking about B2B customers that have or merchants that have tremendously complex business models, they've got tremendously complex product models, pricing tiers and modeling and data modeling for their products and their customers, and just the digitalization of B2B business processes and sales processes, it's a big beast to tackle. It's quite unique and distinct to traditional B2C e-commerce. And I saw a tremendous amount of blue ocean there. And I'm guessing that you saw the same and you said, look, there's massive gaps here. Shopify is not really meeting the market, particularly when you guys started out. You guys, there was really nothing from Shopify that was significantly meeting the market. I almost think of you as a bundle B2B, but for Shopify, because bundle B2B was targeted at big commerce exclusively and still is, and obviously was recently acquired by big commerce as a result. But I almost think of you guys as a bundle B2B for Shopify and that m- you must have seen the same sort of blue ocean opportunity that I saw when I started my consultancy. Yeah, no, that's a really interesting question. If you think we want to be feature parity of bundle B2B within the next six, 12 months. So that is a good start. So if you feature parity on Shopify with bundle B2B means people will choose Shopify over big commerce. The great thing within the B2B space, a lot of the larger enterprise B2B products, they're themeless, they're very dry. The, it doesn't give you that standard B2C e-commerce experience. And that's what a lot of our high-end fashion retailers want. The high-end, When you're selling a big expensive products, you want to be able to use the descriptions, the metadata, all the other information that they've already got stored in Shopify to really help their retailers and, yeah, the end consumers sell their software, then what they're selling. So, yeah, now I think, and, yeah, the other problem we found over this period is Shopify agency, it's a learning curve for them B2B. So we've fed them information, created some documentation, had chats with them to inform them how to do B2B best. Love that. And in fact, I think that Chris sent me, this is going back, I think about a month now, but I love the fact that you guys, when B2B was announced on Shopify, I think that this is going back, I think about six weeks now with their announcement that they were releasing, they I think they called it Shopify Sessions or Shopify, I can't remember exactly what it was, but I'm sorry, what was it called again? By Editions. That's it, Editions, yep. and where they've started to start to have more clear communication around roadmapping of new product features and what's on their roadmap, what's been released, 
what it means to the community, what it means to agencies, what it means to merchants, etc. And they they basically announced that as their first edition of editions, they announced their new B2B functionality, which was over it was simultaneously to me overwhelming and underwhelming in the sense that we all knew that Shopify had to do something from a B2B perspective because their wholesale B2B portal historically has been just absolute rubbish. In fact, I don't know a single merchant running it. We knew that they had to come up with something to combat other mid-market platforms that were doing B2B better, or at least doing it at all versus Shopify not doing it at all. And we saw that come out. And what I love about you guys is that you, you didn't necessarily immediately see that as competition to you. You saw it as an opportunity to help communicate the differentiations between Sparklayer and at least what is today. Shopify's attempt at bringing some B2B functionality in the platform. And you actually sent me a link to your blog, your blog article titled, and I read every single word because it was really engaging and I really enjoyed the content. So well done on that. It reads B2B on Shopify plus what it means for merchants and using Sparklayer as an alternative. And you literally go function by function and compare and contrast the difference between these new functions released by Shopify, which are only available to Shopify plus merchants, as you rightly point out, and you compare and contrast those with your version of that functionality. And in most cases, there's literally no direct comparison because your functionality is freer and so much more broad and deep than that equivalent on Shopify that there really is literally no comparison. And so I love the fact that you said, okay, hey, Shopify is coming out and throwing down the gauntlet and saying they're going to be working on B2B and bringing some new features to platform. But we still see this as a massive opportunity to communicate our value prop to the market despite that. Yeah, no, exactly right. Even early on, we had some customers immediate, immediately contacting us going, okay, they chopped by, just released their version. What is the difference versus Sparkler? So I guess that blog post was largely, largely in response to that. But also, you back in October last year, there were some big changes coming around price lists, which a lot, a lot of people were actually quite surprised. Shopify doesn't allow you to do pricing for different products. So we knew that was coming. We knew there were some big changes around checkout, B2B payment terms, which again, across other platforms have been baked in, baked in for a long time. So a lot of that's come in direct response. I guess the other big thing Shopify have released is their whole sort of self-service portal, they call it. So that's where using Shopify, B2B customers can log in, check their order, uh, you know, pay off uh, sort of payments, et cetera. But yeah, I mean, our, our blog posts and our, I guess our approach in general is really just to highlight the differences. I mean, first things first, we, we do think it's a big step forward for Shopify. They've really you know, listened to what people are asking for. But like you, we, we also believe it's one small step in the direction. The whole self-service, in our view, isn't really self-service. It actually exists on a, def on a different portal. So there are some hints of the old wholesale channel to some degree. When B2B customers log in, they actually get taken off to a different website, which we can see why Shopify have done that from a technical perspective, because like the checkout system, they can create a very generic solution, which is very easy for them to roll out. But as a merchant, you're creating a very disjointed experience. And going back to the point Reese was saying, merchants are looking for a more sort of D to C experience for the customers, rich product pages, very nice design, very nice usability. The Shopify solution doesn't quite do that in our view, and it's still very disjointed. So that to us is a big selling point for our solution. Everything is very embedded on the so Shopify store, which is a huge thing for merchants. And I think from some other points, some of the backend APIs are not available yet. From a headless standpoint, the storefront APIs for B2B aren't available yet. So I think they've still got a long way to go to even take their current product they've released and bring it to fruition for people to use. And yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see what happens over the next two years with it and what they'll Well, I think that they'll be watching you very closely. And I jokingly said, do you think you'll be on their acquisition radar for, I don't know, some ungodly amount of hundreds of millions of dollars? I mean, considering that they bought Deliver for over a billion dollars, you've got to be You've got to be at least on their radar. And I think you rightly pointed out that you're, you always were on their radar right from the beginning, particularly from a sales perspective, because when some of the Shopify engineers and some of the solution architects and some of the sales engineers, when, the, when they were talking to Shopify Plus customers until this, at least until this latest release of some of the Shopify B2B suite, they must have really relied on you quite heavily, I would imagine. I'm just assuming here, and I'll look for you guys to validate this. When a customer wanted to run B2C and potentially B2B simultaneously on the platform, or they loved the idea of running Shopify, but they were a pure play B2B business, there wasn't a lot for them on the Shopify platform. And I'm guessing that some of those sales engineers leaned on you quite heavily to keep those customers in the Shopify fold until such time as Shopify can come out with more native functionality around B2B. So I'm guessing that your 
relationship with Shopify has been a fun one because I guess in some respects, they might consider you a competitor to their future B2B offering. But by the same token, they must have relied on you quite heavily to keep people in the Shopify fold in the meantime. Yeah. No, exactly right. We were there to help them win business effectively. We have quite a few, some Magento companies have moved to Shopify as a result of both ourselves and Shopify working together in pitches. So yeah, we definitely were part of the sales process. A lot of them just couldn't sell the wholesale, so the original wholesale solution for obvious reasons because it was very limited. So yeah, we were yeah, even quite early on you know, used as a some mechanism to help their own team sell the Shopify solution. But yeah, that's been a big part of our story as well. We've built some great relationships. A lot of them, a lot of the engineers sort of come to us. I guess in a way we've given Shopify a sneak peek of their potential roadmap for their own solution by looking at us. No, we're not, we're not scared by that. I think it's we always try to be very open, very visible in terms of what we're doing. You know, we publish a roadmap for every month and you know, we regularly publish our updates. So yeah, that's a big part of our process just to keep open and keep talking to Shopify really. And actually this has been a really good marketing opportunity for us since obviously Shopify B2B has been the big talking point for the last couple of weeks. Yeah, we've seen the uplift in traffic, people chatting to us and yeah, people wanting to know more about our product. That is a perfect on-ramp for you guys to be able to open dialogues in ways that you just wouldn't otherwise and certain leads that may not historically have come your way or able to come your way now. Now, I like also the fact that you have had a reasonably big focus on out-of-the-box integrations with both iPaaS platforms and some of the operational platforms and ERPs. On the back end, you've got an out-of-the-box integration with Patchworks and VL Omni for iPaaS integration. You And as you already pointed out, you integrate with both Shopify and Shopify Plus, so you don't have to be a plus enterprise merchant to be able to make use of Sparklayer. And from a back-end perspective, you integrate with Bright Pearl, Linworks, Kodo, and Unleashed. And it sounds like there's other integrations on the way, and there are, there actually already are some other integrations that maybe appear, at least from what I can tell, maybe not as deep as those main integrations, although you do integrate with the likes of Sin7 and Deer. But I'm yeah. guessing that on your roadmap, you've got some integrations with the likes of maybe Dynamics 365 and maybe NetSuite and some of the other major global SaaS ERPs out there in the market, given the fact that what we know, and I'm sure you would agree, is that when we go into these B2B businesses, oftentimes they are orders of magnitude more complex out of the box than your traditional B2C business would typically be. And as a result of that, a lot of B2C companies, they might not even be running an ERP, right? They might be running an inventory management platform. They might be running an OMS or a WMS and maybe even a pause, but they don't, they're not always running in, in a full-blown ERP. And I'm guessing that you guys, as part of your development roadmap, want to be as turnkey with, a, with as many of those traditional B2B enterprise systems a, as you can to make that an easy and seamless deployment without having to do lots of custom integration. Would that be accurate? Yeah, no, that's totally true. I think our next stage is looking to more of the accountancy markets, such as Xero and QuickBooks, just because we see a heavy, a lot of our clients use those. So we'll be doing that. But yeah, going forward, yeah, more integrations with key ERP, WMS partners, and then slowly growing that out so we can help clients install B2B with a matter of weeks with an, with, without having yeah months long roadmap on building out guys and all these kind of things so they can integrate them with both systems. As part of our like enterprise onboarding, we do go through quite like a technical like process just to see how we bring those systems together. And yeah, some of these systems and some of the ways clients have done their B2B price data, for example, can be crazy. Lots of clients we have will have individual price lists for every single customer. And sometimes that can be up to 50,000 different price lists. No, this is actually why a lot, a lot of people are put off by Shopify. They, they don't believe it's actually possible you know, to integrate these really quite complex systems into the front end. And that's even early on before we actually laid the foundation for the front end, the API was actually our first endeavor. We knew really that was the secret source to make this work. How could we simplify the complexity around pricing, customer rules, things like account credit, account balances, all big things within the B2B space, which for a lot of people, the perception was Shopify just couldn't do that. That's why they like to work in, you know, with Patchworks, VL Omni, all these big integrator systems. You know, that, that unlocks you know, huge potential. We already have quite a few customers using NetSuite. Dynamics, SAP, B1, all these are big enterprise systems. And we've proven, yeah, that it is possible to distill this complexity and still use the power of Shopify to actually deliver the experience. So when we start thinking about what, so in your environment, so I've never installed your app, I've never configured your app for a B2B merchant because I've never done 
that kind of ultra complex solution architecture on Shopify for B2B. I've done lots of really complex B2C stuff and light B2B stuff, but never to the degree that you guys offer functionality around. But I certainly have done B2B on other platforms, i.e. Big Commerce and Magento and other platforms with really complex B2B implementations. And if we're to if we were to start peeling back the onion of where does Shopify end and where does Sparklayer begin, let me just throw out a couple of ideas around some of the complexities I'm seeing in the market that B2B needs to address. And I'm sure you're going to tell me Sparklayer does all of these things and more, but maybe we can start to unpick that onion just a little bit and start to understand how Sparklayer uniquely plugs some of those complex B2B gaps in the market. So typically we see, as you already pointed out, I am seeing exactly the same thing as you. Sometimes it's tiered pricing and group pricing, but often it is a single price list per customer, meaning if they've got 500 customers and 10,000 products, then and they all have their own unique price list, that becomes a heck of a lot of price lists to manage. And then we have then we've had the added complexity where oftentimes in B2B, not only do they have their own unique price list, but they have their own unique catalog ranging. So they'll have access to certain products, but they won't have access to other products. Then we have the complexity of needing to request a quote over and above their default price list. When they get to a certain volume, oftentimes they want to request a special price. They need to request a quote, get a response. Then that needs to be turned into the ability for them to buy at that price for that specific transaction. So almost like a draft cart, if you will, on the back of a quote request. Then we have payments. We've got lots of other complexity, but maybe you can, maybe the first part of this discussion as we start to unpick some of the functionality that's really unique to B2B, we've got users on the B2B side where you've got an organization where traditionally both BigCommerce, Shopify, all the other platforms out there, they traditionally have the concept of one user, one account, one email address. Whereas we know with B2B, not only do we have complexities around price lists and cataloging, but we have complexity around the actual, they almost are like their own unique user group. So they got maybe a senior buyer, a junior buyer, and maybe someone in finance signs off on, on, on all those draft orders before they can actually be completed. So we've got organizational, and they all need their own unique logins, but under the same organization and the same price list. So how do you deal with some of those unique complexities in that B2B world over and above Shopify without breaking some of the traditional authentication stuff that has to happen in Shopify anyway, just to access a Shopify site? That's a really good question. We do have to work around quite a few limitations within Shopify around perhaps API limitations because of the back. And so I guess, yeah, I think our our approach has really been to find the most robust way of doing it. We don't want to build a solution which down the road might, might cause issues, both in terms of integrations for the merchant. So yeah, our approach has always been to use you know, Shopify is the foundation, figure out you know, really good ways to actually work around perhaps the limitations they have. But in terms of actual sort of experience, yeah, the big thing is the cost, you know, the merchant still gets to use the Shopify platform. We're there just replacing parts of the experience which are related to B2B ordering. Don't really about to say to me. Yeah, so I think if you think from the customers and the sub accounts in those companies, we use the Shopify Plus platform. We're about to release this. We use the Shopify platform for authentication and everything and essentially the customers are just linked because we run a complete independent front end which is little widgets you put on the page which replace the pricing interfaces in standard shopify we replace the cart with our own cart we have a lot more control than the other b2b apps on shopify and because of that we can ensure that we are yeah essentially layering on top our B2B system. This provides the customer sub account experience, complete independent pricing from Shopify. And then, yeah, moving on to what you mentioned about the quoting system, this is a point when they request a quote in our platform, it's essentially created as a Shopify draft order. And that allows the customer from that point on to effectively do what they would like with that. But yeah, to make sure we're moving forward, we'll be building out a larger quoting system going forward too. Love it. And how do you guys work with Shopify checkout is notoriously locked down. Even on Shopify Plus, there's there's nothing there's no equivalent on Shopify today of say big commerce checkout SDK. There's just there's no equivalent on Shopify for some of these other even semi-lockdown SaaS platforms where you can make pretty extensive checkout customizations. For you guys, do you completely replace the Shopify checkout altogether with your own native PCI compliant checkout that's independent of Shopify and then simply recreate the order via API back in Shopify once they complete your checkout? Or do you have some sort of backdoor unique integration with Shopify checkout that allows you to take over certain portions of it? 
Yeah, essentially, we run the micro checkout on our end, and we will only use the Shopify checkout if the customer is paying upfront, i.e., through credit card or any other Shopify payment method. Otherwise, we just create the shop the order as a draft order in Shopify, which then can be converted into an order automatically if needed. Love it. And so, in that scenario, how does that work with Shopify surcharging? on orders that don't use Shopify payments as the payment method, do they simply get stung only on the orders that use a payment method that isn't Shopify payments, which in this case, I'm guessing that <laughs> almost all B2B orders don't use Shopify payments because they're on effectively on, on credit or on account. That, that's the problem when, as soon as you use the Shopify payment system, you're immediately being charged the eight percentage of that transaction fee. Within the B2B world, you know, very few actually will take payments up front, like credit card, debit card, et cetera. So, yeah, typically is you know, some net payment terms, from our sort of technical point of view, we effectively treat those like draft orders. So the order gets placed in our micro checkouts on the front end, comes through the draft order. Once it's through the draft order, that can then get pinged off to an ERP system or it can stay within Shopify. And then the merchant then through their sort of current workflows will then handle payments typically through I think, bank transfer, the eight and you know, offline methods where they're not having to Puts of twenty thousand dollars through a checkout, which just isn't practical from a financial point of view. It's actually very few B two B customers will actually use upfront payments unless they have quite small order volumes or an average order value actually makes sense for them. It's an interesting thing with the Shopify's B two B platform that we've seen. We've had a few people come to us and find because they use their account area, which has a so if you place an order for your Shopify B2B and you have net terms of 30 days, you go into their account section. And it wants you to pay through the Shopify checkout, therefore paying the fees. Because it's yeah. in this locked account area, you can't remove that button. So it'd be interesting to know where they're going with this. And yeah, is it to try and push their customers down that route of processing fees? And just to make this clear here, everything apart from upfront payment, there's no processing fees in Shopify's system when using Sparkler. Yeah. Federal classifies as a manual payment method, which all intents and purposes is a offline payment. Yep. And I guess that elegantly skirts some of those complexities and considerations and you raise a very valid point reese which is what is shopify's intention with this given the fact that over 70 percent of shopify's revenue and profitability today is driven through payments right so they are becoming day by day and that that rose from like 50 percent to 70 percent in the last i think two years 24 months so when we think about shopify they're probably less of an e-commerce platform now and more of a payments platform right and now they're opening up Shopify payments to be able to be used on other devices, on other platforms as effectively a plug-in payment method in other places. And as a result of that, we can see that is a heavy focus of theirs. And so you're right. I think it is an open question about how they move this forward in a B2B environment where effectively the vast majority of those payments would typically be treated as an offline payment method. What are they going to try to do to incentivize that? Are they going to bring, for example, DH payments like balance payments, which is a th third party payment provider for B2B, are they going to look to bring some of those traditional B2B payment methods into Shopify payments so they can continue to make the revenue off payments? I think that's an open question. Would you agree? Exactly. We hear about ACH as a request all the time. So I think as a strategic move for Shopify, that makes a lot of sense. I think broadly speaking, I think the Shopify B2B helps them as a retention exercise. I think they've been very aware of merchants not evaluating Shopify because of the weak B2B solution. So I think the first step is to address the retention. We have it down the roads. Yeah, perhaps better ways of handling payments, which yeah, within the B2B space just have, have to be considered very differently to B2C. It's a very different sort of kettle of fish, really. Any client that's doing an average order for a B2B of over $1,000 will ask this question because they want to know exactly, are they going to lose another 0.1%, 0.5% on every transaction or even higher if they put, put through car transaction fees. And it's a very common way Internally, we have something called customer groups, and on those customer groups, you can change payment methods per group. And yeah, a lot of those customer groups, they will generally have a smaller customer group for independent stores, for example, where you may allow upfront payments. But for the customer groups where you're selling to maybe a distributor in a different country, you will definitely turn off that upfront payment option. The margins are so slim within B2B, having to give an extra couple of percent to a payment processor is enough to actually cause a lot of financial issues. So. Yeah, yeah, as you say, interesting to see where Shopify take it, really. Yeah. It feels like a stopgap solution, what they have right now. And it also raises the question of how B2B buy now, pay later will work going forward. There's a lot of like traction within that space. So it's just, 
It's something we hear a lot of. And yeah, we have obviously a connection with Hakodu, but it'd be interesting to see how that works long term. Well, especially given the fact that the entire BNPL sector, I think, is in question right now, full stop. And it does beg the question with Klarna having a massive down round with some of the other BNPLs either completely going out of business or on the ropes, zip on the ropes. There's a lot of these BNPL services that are obviously Afterpay's been acquired, and I think they potentially would have been in real trouble if they hadn't have been. So I, I think BNPL full stop is in question. I think some of those other B2B specific payment methods are in question about how to Shopify address those and keep those within the payments ecosystem where they can get a clip of the ticket. But I think if we move beyond that, one of the things that Shopify has quote unquote touted about their B2B functionality is the ability to run B2C and B2B on the, or D2C even and B2B on the same storefront with that B2B functionality based on a specific user's login and then being able to have access to certain functionality that a B2C user wouldn't be able to have. So effectively trying to manage that through customer groups, B2B and B2C customer groups, but you guys in your functionality much beyond that. So I'm guessing that most of your widgets, are they built out of Shopify sections that effectively can be selectively displayed depending on who's authenticated yeah, no, essentially. They're, they don't use so much as Shopify sections. This is so weird. We can go onto any theme really easily. They're essentially yep. the HTML tags that you can put anywhere on the web page to yeah, introduce a product page, like a product table to buy items or a little pricing widget or a little quick buy section. And then, yeah, we, we have clients that get integrated within an hour from a theme standpoint. So it's great for kind of getting that onboarding really quickly. And this is what people want. They don't want to spend a lot of money on a B2B platform to find out, especially ones that are just starting out into the B2B space. They want to get something working, test the market, see what see what happens, and then slowly grow it. So it's a really quick and easy way to get started quickly. Where if you think of Shopify Plus on their B2B channel, you will need a lot of customizations on the front end to give a better B2B experience. And yeah, long term, we'll be interested to see how Shopify bring that into the in bring that out into their theming stuff and things like that. And then the whole blended slash hybrid B2C, B2B is actually quite interesting. On the surface, it sounds really good. But I think we've learned actually, in reality, there's far more complexities than people think about. For example, mm -hmm. perhaps you might want a different product range for B2B customers. Perhaps you have different stock pools for B2B. So right now, Shopify won't. Be, you can't segment stock pool based on the customer type, which is quite a big limitation. Yep. Things around perhaps content. So actually, we probably find half our merchants actually opt for a completely separate website. Through Shopify, obviously, there are ways to synchronize stock, products, data, all, all sorts of stuff. Yeah, they're big, so blended B2C, B2B. In reality, I think we, we don't believe it's quite that simple, but yeah, it can be a good way for people to, to test the waters just to see how it goes, really. Yeah, I guess the thing for me is that, and I go through a very similar discovery process with my clients. And if I find that they've got really simple dip the toe in the water kind of requirements around B2B, then sometimes we can do a, a converged storefront where maybe they just need a single unique price list for all B2B customers across all products. And they have access to the entire cat same catalog as, as B2C, et cetera. Then, hey, maybe we could do a converged storefront. But I run into the exact same thing as you, which is to say the moment we start needing highly customized front end experiences for the B2B customer. Sure, we can hide a lot of that stuff through CSS if you're a authenticated yeah. B2C customer, et cetera. But then we have extra load that shouldn't be there for the B2C experience just to support hiding B2B. I'm totally in your camp, which is to say that the vast majority of the time, even if a brand wants to have, say, a D2C play and a B2B play, they're far better off, particularly if they're running Shopify Plus, where they've already got the ability in most instances, depending on their agreement, to have up to 10 storefronts on Shopify Plus anyway as, as yeah. part of their subscription. Why wouldn't you customize the bejesus out of that B2B experience to make it really tailored to the B2B buyer and what they expect, and then tailor your B2C experience or your D2C experience really tailor that to the expectations of that type of customer. And so I'm totally in agreement with you that that converged model, it can work if you have super simple, super basic B2B requirements, but you pretty soon run into a place, particularly if you're imagining scaling at any point in the near future, that you need to start out of the gate planning for that type of experience right from day one. And even things like maintenance, if you're maintaining a sort of blended store with different logic and spit across the website, it just becomes a nightmare for people. So, yeah, se separate stores really is where we see people heading. It's one thing that I think Shopify yeah, should bring more in-house is data between these stores. They have all the data and they don't do provide any syncing processes between the stores, which, yeah, there's lots of apps out there that do it. But if they could do that in-house, it'd be perfect. Yeah, and I think one of the reasons why they probably haven't gone down that route, and I'd love your thought, thoughts on this, 
is that what I find, particularly with B2B, is that 95% of the time they're running an ERP or an a inventory management system of some description, quasi ERP, like a deer systems or whatever, that maybe has financials in a different system like a zero. But because of that, Shopify doesn't necessarily see themselves as the single source of truth for inventory data anyway. And as a result of that, because you're going to be integrating your two different storefronts, your B2C and your B2B storefront directly with that single source of truth of inventory, they probably feel like we wouldn't be, even if we provided that that auto sync functionality based on a SKU match, we probably wouldn't provide that functionality anyway because enterprise class users wouldn't use it. That would be my thinking if I was Shopify. Yeah, it's a fair, it's a fair point. I think also... From a standpoint of yeah, duplicating these stores, yeah, most of the time, uh, enterprise style customers have PIMs, ERP systems. They're getting a lot of that data from those sources. But I think p- people are quite scared of creating that second shop. It's something that we've had to explain uh, quite a few times. It's not as much work as you, it sounds, and actually, general, generally, the maintenance is ten times easier than it does sound. So yeah, once you've got over that hurdle and explained how it works, yeah, most of the time, people actually will, will opt for that option. Love it. And from a functional perspective, is there anything else that you see that is super high on your customer's typical priority list where they come to you and they say, hey, we need our B2B system to be able to do these things. And that's what's driven some of the product development that you guys have done. That is there a hit list of, say, a top two or three pieces of functionality that the vast majority of your customers would rely on in your platform? Yeah, there's one feature we call it sales agents so that's the ability where the merchant sales team can actually log in place orders on behalf of customers so check their orders repeat order see their prices so that by far is probably the most asked thing we get we get from customers beyond that tiered pricing is another big thing being able to offer some incremental discounts based on the volumes purchased again that's not possible to do on the native b2b shopify so yeah those two features sales agents quantity pricing those are the two so I guess the two big things where nearly every time a customer comes to us, they have that on the wish list. Obviously, sales agent ordering, that's a huge part of a B2B operation. They have some sales teams on the roads. Perhaps they're taking phone orders on behalf of customers. We have a very elegant way of doing that. Again, what happens within the context of the Shopify store, the sales agent can log in. We get a very nice interface. And the beauty is it all goes through the same workflow. It comes into what comes into Shopify as an order get sent off to the warehouse, gets tagged in a certain way. Yeah, that's really what, I guess, in a lot of ways set, sets our product apart at this point. And the good thing with the sales agents, it's one of those things that just works out of the box. There's no additional setup. There are ways to maybe do it on Shopify Plus. We're very complicated. Yeah, long lead time, a lot of development. But yeah, ours, yeah, if you upgrade to a plan that supports sales agents, it's just, yeah, one click, enable sales agent, boom. And there's small things like being able to do things like pack sizing or pallet sizing. Again, they seem quite small things, but actually there's a lot of complexity behind it. Again, that's also baked into our solution. Yeah, we, we try, we're trying to deliver a, it's a very feature-rich platform on the surface. It does look very simple. Which I guess is the goal, right? You alluded to some of those unique product models that Shopify doesn't support out of the box. Like it doesn't support bundles and kits and bombs and all sorts of other much more complex product models. Yes, you can, with heavy amounts of front-end customization, you can usually support those through meta- metadata or tags or various other weird and wonderful hacks on the front end. You can usually make that happen. But if you guys natively out of the box support more of those more complex product models that we typically see in the B2B world, then that means a customer or a merchant can get up and running with those complex product models significantly faster using Sparklayer than they could with custom development on Shopify. The big thing is we're not some hijacking functionality. So Shopify has this concept of what they call meta fields. A lot, a lot of people use that to do sort of weird and wacky ways of achieving stuff. We purposely don't touch any of that infrastructure. So everything's very isolated. I mean, it means we're very clean, it's a clean technical solution. And we have been part of our sort of, yeah, sort of, our, our sort of secret really. We haven't had to do lots of hacks and workarounds, which yeah. lots of other people have had to do. Technically, by us running our own cart, we can go so much further and we have so much more control. A lot of the other ways, you try and shoehorn ways into Shopify's own cart system where it's not built for that. So yeah, we, we have a lot more control. And because of that, I guess this is why, yeah, from the headless approach, we can drop onto other platforms because we're running so much by ourselves. Makes complete sense. Now, if you were to look out over the next six to 12 months on the flip side of this coin, 
are there is there a piece of functionality or several pieces of functionality that your customers are routinely coming to you and saying hey we would love to go with sparklayer or and we can't today because it needs to do these one or two things or we already run sparklayer and we'd love it to do these one or two additional things that's my first question but part b of that question is are you planning to have more drop-in integration similar to shopify but on say big commerce salesforce commerce cloud magento whatever the case may be to where it's as plug and play on those platforms as it is on Shopify today. So just obviously I don't need specifics about your proprietary product roadmap, but are there certain pieces of functionality that the market is crying out for that you want to add? And from a default drop in integration perspective, what's next on the cards for you guys? One thing we hear time and time again at the moment is drop shipping and EDI. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> this is getting so big at the moment that we're looking at how we can bring our platform to support. We have some customers that have given us some really good feedback and yeah, we're going to start building that out. And especially EDI. EDI is very lackluster and some of these smaller independent really want to get in with the, the larger shops. So they're, they're just ch uh, chasing us for it. And the, I guess the other thing is like these B2B marketplaces, there's lots popping up. Um, there's a lot of traction around it. And yeah, it's an interesting uh, to see where that goes to and how we can support our customers using those things. And then to your second point, yeah, firstly, I think we, have, we want to bring, get closer to Zero and QuickBooks. So we're looking at what's available there. But yeah, long term, the long term plan will be another platform. And yeah, I guess we, we can't say much yet. Love it. Love, love the fact that you've got this vision for where you want to go. And so there's, it's this combination of, it, it's a fine line, right? So you've got to have a pretty clear vision of where you want to take the product independent of customer feedback, because you just have a vision for where you, and a passion for where you want to take your product. But by the same token, you have to balance that equally with customer needs and gaps in the market that your customers are telling you already exist. So it, it is a delicate balancing act. And it's good to hear that you're trying to straddle that as, as best as you can. Now, if do you think that, do you believe, and I know this is very much finger in the air and you probably have no idea what's necessarily cooking behind the scenes at Shopify. Do you think that Shopify has an intention to effectively almost look to you as a roadmap for developing internal functionality? Or do you think that they're going to stay mostly in their sandbox and it's going to be a limited and relatively slow release of new enhanced B2B functionality over and above what they've already announced? Or do you think that they have an intent to be super aggressive with their roadmap and come after all comers from a B2B perspective? I think, unfortunately, Shopify is a very large machine. And I think yeah. for them to move quickly, they will struggle to do that. I think they are probably targeting the bottom end of that B2B market to just pull people, more people into Shopify Plus ecosystem. And I think, yeah, with us alongside it, should they continue chasing the B2B space or that heavy high-end B2B market? Is it worthwhile for them long-term? Does it make sense? I don't know. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to know where, what happens next in the next couple of years. I guess the hardest thing for them is building a generic solution. Obviously, the big piece of this puzzle is figuring out how to bring a true self-service feature to the front end. If I try to release that across million, millions of merchant sites, all with custom themes, custom layouts, I think that's actually a very difficult thing for them to solve. Whereas with our solution, is very plug and play. It works with any Shopify theme, any custom development theme. And so we basically can't see how they're going to solve that, which is why you're seeing various of generic I guess a generic approach is being released the new account area, the checkout. I think that's going to be a big, a big thing for them to try and to try and solve if they can at all. And I guess it would be difficult to compete with you guys commercially as well, because if I look at your your pure SaaS platform, you plug in seamlessly with Shopify. Your pricing is ultra reasonable. You've got a forty nine dollar starter plan going up to Pro at two ninety nine a month for up to one hundred and fifty B two B orders a month. And as you rightly pointed out, some of those the AOVs on B two B tend to be sky high. So where you might see a thousand plus orders a week or even a day with some B2C sites. Typically the order volumes through B2B are much smaller, but the order values are significantly higher as a result. And so that that pro two ninety nine a month might suit a significant percentage of the potential B2B merchants out there. But then you've also got your enterprise plan, which is a, it sounds like it's a negotiated price depending on the features the functionality the number of orders going through the platform etc but it does also include when you get to the enterprise level with you guys full scoping 24 7 support full onboarding like white glove customer success etc etc so you get like account management so it feels like you guys have tried to through your pricing to put customers all the way from i i imagine 49 bucks a month is more like what you would see as like a self-service 
B2B merchant that has relatively low complexity needs. They can mostly onboard themselves with maybe a little bit of help from you and maybe, I don't know, maybe some paid professional services and consulting or something like that, all the way up to the enterprise scale and everything in between. It feels like you've tried to classify those merchants into reasonable buckets based on your pricing. Yeah, no, totally. I think for the lower end tiers, yeah, these are the people that are not on plus. They just want something quick and easy to get some price lists set up. They may have two price lists and yeah, within an hour they can get set up. But to the enterprise tier, these customers, they want to know exactly what they're getting. They want that kind of white glove treatment. They want demos of each feature. They want to see how it works within workflows. So I kind of look at it as more of a consultancy from us. Whilst they pay, sometimes there's no upfront fee. And yeah, after that, it's a monthly fee. But again, it's like that agency style PM customer success system. Does that make sense, Chris? Yeah, and it's really the enterprise where we are trying to focus. Those are the merchants where arguably we can add the most value. We can make sense of the complexity perhaps around in the ERP system, how they can very neatly integrate it with Shopify and other platforms. Yeah, as a sort of direction, that's really where we're trying to uh, sort of head really. But at the same time, the smaller customers add tremendous value. They help contribute towards the things we should be building, help give us some really great feedback. And often we see those same merchants scale through the plan. Perhaps they're testing the waters, but monthly they're launching a new campaign and needs and they're pushing more, more orders through the system. It's all designed to grow as customers grow really like a sort of traditional SaaS product. M makes absolute sense. And it's pretty clear from your pricing model is super transparent. It it's very clear on what's included. It, in fact, it's probably clear and more transparent than a lot of, I guess, SaaS pricing models that I see online where it says contact us to, to learn more. So yeah, look, I love the direction that you guys are headed with this. Look, the time is absolutely flown by. I've super, super enjoyed this conversation. Love what you guys are doing. Have been admiring you from afar for a while now and was super keen to get you guys on. We're we're coming to the place where we've introduced this segment where I turn the microphone over to you. I turn the tables on myself and I let you guys ask me one question, any question you like, and I'll do my very best to answer it. So I'll give you two shots because there's two of you and you've graced me with nearly an hour of your time each. I'm going to let both of you fire a question at me. So you get to decide who goes first between you and I'll do my best to answer your question. So I think firstly, where do you think B2B is going to go in the next five years? I, I think I wouldn't, I guess, have hitched my wagon to the B2B horse as tightly as I have as a consultancy if I didn't believe that the opportunity in B2B w was massive. I believe we're going to see such a rapid maturation in B2B commerce over the next five years that it is the bigger opportunity we know commercially. We look at the data around the world of the dollars being transacted through B2B, traditional B2B channels. So it's, I think it's something like 10 to one of B2C. So we already know globally that the opportunity commercially through B2B e-commerce is just ridiculous. And we know that B2C is incredibly mature already. The design patterns we see in B2C e-commerce are well known. They're pretty common. The commerce stacks are pretty common. Most of those systems are relatively plug and play with each other now. It's all pretty, pretty relatively seamless and relatively well known. B2B, on the other hand, I think there's a lot more agencies right now, especially as the economy is starting to turn. They're going, okay, we can't necessarily rely on the B2C and D2C market the way that we traditionally have for all of our revenue. We have got to get it together when it comes to being able to consult and develop for B2B. That to give guidance, to do marketing for B2B, to be able to do the upfront consulting and the solutioning and the scoping, the process conversion between analog to digital processes. I think that we're going to see many more agencies either pivot entirely to focusing on B2B or developing a strong practice around B2B. And then I think there's going to be a lot more consultants coming into the market for B2B as well. I feel like I'm a little bit on my own down here in this part of the world, which is great because it's blue ocean stuff for me. But I think the opportunity in B2B is absolutely incredible. And I think we're going to see more rapid rate of growth because B2B e-commerce has been so immature and has lagged so far behind B2C e-commerce, even from just an understanding perspective internally inside these B2B businesses, what's possible from an e-commerce perspective. I and mean, when I go in and I consult to a lot of these B2B businesses and I start telling them just the normal stuff we would do in B2C around personalization and search and merch and all these other things that have become really mature in B2C, when you start talking to B2B businesses about this stuff, their eyes grow like saucers and that is super exciting so i think it's going to go nuts personally yeah, great answer we're on, we're on exactly the same page and i'd say a lot of our audience yeah i'd say a lot i'd say maybe a third of our customer base have never done b2b online 
and they yep. see this as a massive growth sector for them. They see that reordering process being so easy. They'll get more orders through. A lot of these people come from a place where emailing orders in and phone is normal. And yeah, once they see how easy it is, they definitely see how this can be grow. And yeah, such as adding personalization, simple reordering techniques and other ways like that, they just see, yeah, their eyes just go, yeah, this is perfect. And there is, a, I'm seeing a trend also in these B2B businesses where they might be really old family businesses. I'm dealing with one business now that's a B2B business and has been around for 40 years. The grandson of the founder is now running the company and they and their customers now the children of the founders of the B2B customers that they've been dealing with historically are taking over running those businesses. And because they're younger and they're much more digitally native, they are now putting pressure on their B2B suppliers to offer them B2B e-commerce self-service because that's how they run the rest of their life. And so where their parents and grandparents in B2B never expected, they expected sales reps to come up and schmooze them and wine them and dine them and all the rest. The younger generation is all about efficiency. They're all about ease of use. They're all about self-service. So that's putting pressure on these B2B merchants to, to upgrade their digital commerce capabilities as well. Because it's just being pressured from the new generation of B2B buyer. And especially when, yeah, sadly, recession is looming. I think people need to make things easier, quicker, want to do it out of hours. If you're running a small independent shop, uh, you don't have time to ring up, send an email, do that kind of stuff. But yeah, there's definitely a lot of pressure for B2B companies to move with the times, essentially. Completely agree. Chris? So in the UK, we have a radio, famous radio show called Desert Island Discs. We're basically asked the person, if you're stuck on a desert island, which one piece of music would you bring with you and why? Wow, that is such an awesome question. I love that question. My my favorite band of all time, and this is going to date myself, so it's freaking embarrassing. My favorite band, I like all sorts of music, but Journey, my favorite band. And I think Don't Stop Believing would probably be the one that I'd have to listen to because it would amp me up and it would keep me going on a deserted island. Great choice. Yeah, no, that's true. Perfect choice. <laughs> I'd have to do it. I'd have to do it. As embarrassing as <laughs> that is. No, you definitely need it when you're on an island. <laughs> nice. Gentlemen, it has been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. You guys are clearly extremely switched on what you're doing. You know what you're on about. You know what you're talking about. You're super passionate about B2B. You're taking on the big boys over at Shopify with your amazing turnkey spark layer platform. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And look, I'd love to get you on. It sounds like you got a great roadmap in store. So I'd love to get you on another 6, 12, 18 months and just see how far Sparklayer has come in the intervening time because I have a sneaking suspicion you guys are going to crush it. Yeah, no, we'd absolutely love to. Yeah, it's been great fun. And yeah, that's a great time, a nice conversation. Are you a merchant or software vendor that is focused on e-commerce or omni-channel? Then head over to greenwoodconsulting.net to see how we can help you scale your business.